L G B L G B L G B L G B They say L G B everywhere I go L G B on the main I don't know L G B whatever it is L G B come on help me please please all righty then thank you <laughs> LGB. That let's go, Brandon. Right? LGB. This means let's go, Brandon. No. LGB. Sounds like let's go, Brandon. I guess. LGB. All right. Let's go, Brandon. I am Cornelio. Chant. LGB. Right wing and left wing. LGB. Go. Oh, you know the thing. LGB. If you don't sing, that back. LGB and you play black. LGB. Let's go, Brandon. LGB. Let's go, Brandon. LGB. Let's go, Brandon. FJB. Let's go, Brandon. I'm Joe Biden, and I forgot this message. Greetings, my dear friends, and welcome to another episode of Reading Epic Threads. I'm your host, Patrick Gunnels, joining you from Houston, Texas, this April 1st, 2024, at 3.03 p.m. Central Daylight Time. I've got a great show for you today, but first, I would like to present to you an advertisement made by my sister, Rebecca. He said something that really hit home about uh, this phenomena of chemtrails. Manganese will make you kill your mama. How much manganese are you spraying in my neighborhood at night while I'm asleep? Military and some commercial jets have been fitted with huge barrels of at least 49 different kinds of documented chemical poisons. Barium is toxic to all mammals. Aluminum is known to diminish kidney function and destroy brain cells and cognitive function. A problem, a serious problem. Patent number 5003186 describes cooling the earth with metal oxides sprayed into the stratosphere. And I thought, well, geez, this is what I do for a living. I was finding tons and tons of large quantities of aluminum, barium, strontium in the forms of oxides and sulfates. Instead of protecting the people, we are poisoning the people. Go to epicminerals.net to get the Epic Minerals Zeolite Spray. Five sprays into your mouth in the morning and then five sprays at night. Causes heavy metals to bind to the zeolite in the solution. leaving your And then they leave your body as normal waste products. And then fulvic and humic acid in the spray remineralizes your tissues. And the results are amazing. Uh, my... My wife, Ashley, says that it's the brain fog be gone. It also just removes all sorts of toxicity that you are probably laboring under like a millstone round your neck. Go to epicminerals.net and use promo code Shapiro to pry a dollar from my grasping hands. And with that, let's begin with Dr. Naomi Wolf. I don't ever read these things before. You're, you're watching me read them for the first time to myself. So sometimes they say stuff I disagree with. I read it anyway, unless it's just something that I regard as beyond the pale. All right, here we go. From naomiwolf.substack.com, letter from Amsterdam. The lights flicker off in Europe by Dr. Naomi Wolf. Brian and I arrived in Amsterdam on a Monday morning after two full days in airports. The journey had seemed weirdly challenged from the start. A wild snowstorm had canceled our initial flight and delayed us by a day. When we finally arrived at Schiphol Airport, tired and stressed, and as we sought to enter the country through customs, Brian was detained in an interview room and questioned extensively by three different officials. He was fingerprinted and handprinted and had extra facial photographs taken. There was no food or water present. 
my wonderful Dutch publisher, founder of the alternative press, successbecken.nl, Fred Meidrus and his son and colleague, Patrick, waited patiently with me just outside of arrivals, buying me coffees as my anxiety mounted. At last, after seven hours, Brian was released. We settled into a lovely hotel in the charming village of Zeist, set in ancient forests about an hour from Amsterdam, and my media tour began. My book, Facing the Beast, which is based on my Substack essays here about life in the dark era of the present, and which reveals what the War Room Daily Clout Pfizer Documents Research volunteers uncovered in their 100 reports based on 450,000 documents, that is, the greatest crime against humanity ever committed, was published in a European country for the first time, and it was also the first time I had been in Europe, indeed, outside the United States since the quote-unquote pandemic. Honestly, I had been afraid to travel. As my work as a critic of lockdown measures and vaccines gained sometimes global attention, I feared leaving the states, since we have, believe it or not, protections against detention of dissidents in the U.S. that do not apply as soon as one leaves American soil. At the same time, I was excited to meet the freedom fighters in Europe and to see for myself what resistance to Agenda 2030 tyranny is rising up in this beleaguered and important part of the world, one that, as you may know, I believe is being systematically targeted exactly as the U.S. is and for similar reasons. Europe and America must be snuffed out, it is my conviction, as bastions of human rights and of the traditions of representative democracy. Five days of media events followed. I felt powerful mixed emotions as Fred and Patrick drove me to my first interview. I had visited the Netherlands three times previously. Each time, I was overjoyed to be in that country. I love the extraordinary beauty of Amsterdam, its jewel-box-like central area of 17th-century brick houses, tall and narrow with their decorative roof lines, flower pots, and painted wooden shutters, the canals and the arched bridges rhythmically spanning them, the canal boats tied languorously alongside the banks the down-to-earth but quirkily elegant bars and cafes and restaurants and the tradition of majestic floral arrangements in interiors, long lacy tulips and greenery and budding boughs spilling over the sides of tall architectural vases. But I had also always loved the sane, open-minded, curious, and fair demeanor and tradition of the Dutch people themselves. The Netherlands heritage, like so many cultures that are being erased and polluted right now by the globalists' agenda, is a precious one. The Netherlands did much to establish the modern era of the individual in the Middle Ages and early Renaissance. Bourgeois has been recast as a derogatory term by the Marxist influence on our era that distorted so many meanings and thus so much of our history. But the initial development of the bourgeois society that originated in the Netherlands was a vastly positive development in human history. It meant the rise of the middle classes with some power of their own, a class of citizens with a say in outcomes who were not serfs and were not aristocracy. With this notion came the ascendancy, too, of the idea that hard work and merit, as opposed to just noble birth, could secure wealth and political influence. These are radical beautiful ideas. The Dutch also developed a republic before the French or Germans did. Indeed, theirs was the first European republic. They innovated local representation by citizen, citizens and the development of currency exchanges that allowed trade and exploration around the world. The middle-class Dutch family with its norms of respectability and community contributions, as well as its religious probity, was strengthened by and strengthened in turn, strengthened in turn this bourgeois ideal as well. 
Holland led the way too, as early as the Middle Ages with religious tolerance. Thriving Jewish communities in Holland were free from the persecution that Jews faced elsewhere in Europe, and in the 16th century, Anglican refugees from England, indeed Puritans, found shelter in that community as well. The Dutch colonized what became America. In the Hudson Valley, where we live now, almost all of the place names are Dutch. We live, indeed, on a tributary of the Royliff Jansen Kill. Kill derives from Middle Dutch and means water channel or riverbed. Oddly, the long and important history of the Dutch as our colonizers prior to the English has been largely written out of U.S. textbooks and history books would it be too destabilizing for us to know that some of the first European Americans were so relatively sane, tolerant, and productive? The Dutch showed admirable resistance to tyranny more recently as well. Though Holland was occupied by the Nazis, Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial is replete with stories of individual Dutch citizens who sheltered Jews, Anne Frank's family being the most famous at great, great risk to themselves. This valuable legacy, this beautiful culture, is being strangled now by Agenda 2030, and the damage is in plain sight. As we drove and then walked the street of Amsterdam, I felt the sharp contrast between the before times before 2020, and now. The vibrant, cheery, sunny city I had recalled was now subdued. There were many fewer people on the street. I understood that Amsterdam is being targeted to become a 15-minute city. Graffiti defaced buildings on the outskirts of town. This shocked me. As the tidiness and civic pride of Amsterdam in the pre-2020 era had meant that the city had been, at least in my memory, graffiti-free. I had remembered the skies as being often as blue as the blue in Dutch ceramics, a deep mid-blue with luscious white cumulus clouds or else gray skies that had been poetically wind-driven with shades of light and darkness. This had been a famously lovely sky and Clouds captured by Jacob van Ruisdael, view of Harlem below, along with centuries worth of other landscape painters, but the sky seemed now, day after day, to be heavily saturated with biofuel exhaust or with some sort of soupy chemical cloud cover. Thick contrails crisscrossed the skies now, pushing white particulate along in heavy streaks. The effect was that the whole country, once so famously bright, seemed now to be a world over which a gray shade had been pulled down. Paintings by Peter de Hooch, Courtyard of a House in Delft, 1658. Let's take a quick look at them again. 1658, these paintings. In spite of my sense of a somber change, my interviews were moving and enlightening. There is a strong resistance movement here, but the forces of opposition in Europe are far stronger than they are in the U.S. Seeing what is happening to the Netherlands is like looking down the road at our own future three to five years ahead if we do not fight back. I was interviewed by Thierry Baudet and Ralph Decker, two leaders of the resistance. Baudet, a dynamic, dark-haired, younger generation politician, is the founder of what he describes as the most energetic anti-globalist party, Forum for Democracy. He is a parliamentarian along with colleagues in his party. Ralph Decker is a former parliamentarian who is now leading a leading candidate for the European Parliament. Thierry Baudet above, Ralph Decker below. Thierry Baudet. So he's French. And then Ralph Decker, that, that seems like a Dutch name, to the best of my ability to discern. In a well-appointed TV studio in the Herengracht, one of the loveliest streets in Amsterdam, we spoke about global politics, the mRNA vaccines, and the state of liberty in the Netherlands. I focused on the fact that it is very difficult for citizens in the Netherlands to know about legislation affecting them, let alone to lobby for or against it. 
We spoke about how sovereignty has been drained from national parliaments in Europe by the metastructure of the EU, which, as German MEP Christine Anderson also points out, is a meta-European tyranny and not, as its propaganda depicts it, a meta-democracy. Thierry Baudet wishes to have the Netherlands exit the EU. To me, this prospect of exit from the EU is the only chance European nations have of regaining their sovereignty and their parliament's actual representation for their citizens. These politicians are routinely described as far-right and as conspiracy theorists. I do not know their entire platform, but from our two-hour conversation, I was struck by the fact that the views that could be considered completely mainstream Dutch in 2019, such as believing the right of the individual rather than of the state to determine one's life path, believing in a free press, were now characterized as far-right or as extremist. Our next stop was Leiden, another exquisite, historic, smaller town. We stopped at a traditional pancake house for the Massive, thin Dutch pancakes served with stewed cherries and whipped cream. These filled entire Delft blue and white platters about a foot and a half wide. In yet another picture-perfect 17th century streetscape, we entered a townhouse whose interior gladdened my heart. Dark, heavy rafters, 14-foot high ceilings, 18th and 19th century heavy carved wooden furniture, the necessary pot of fresh flowers on a wide wooden table, a tea and coffee area. Why do Europeans so much more than Americans understand the value of hot drinks, biscuits, and even bottles of wine in every workplace? A fine TV studio was in an adjacent room. I met the celebrity lingerie designer, Marlies Deckers. She emanated like a ray of sunshine from the first moment we encountered one another. We embraced like long-lost sisters. She is a beautiful woman with long, shining, copper-colored curls who wore a fantastic, multicolored mini-dress with a flounced skirt, puffed sleeves, and a bodice. I adored from the start her take on femininity. As I followed her into the studio, I caught sight of her red vinyl dancing shoes with clear plexiglass wedges for the heels. Pictured here, Marley's Decker, Deckers. Femininity is a complex set of myths, but a condition full of promise, and my readers know that I've spent years trying to figure out how a woman can embrace seductiveness, if she so chooses, and pleasure and adornment, and still be strong and serious and effective. Every woman solves this problem for herself, but the festive way Deckers approached fashion and allure was, I felt, a delightful work of art. I had not realized at first that she was not only a leading dissident, but a very famous lingerie designer. She gave me two of her glossy, beautifully shot catalogs, and I was impressed that her fashion features managed to depict the models as sensual, but not as sex objects. A goal of consciousness and theory that I had sought since my book, The Beauty Myth, and that very few designers or artists or photographers have, in my view, attained. We spoke on camera about the war against humanity in the Netherlands. Her show is donations supported and it is part of the thriving alternative media that has arisen in the Netherlands in the presence of the globalist attack and would-be coup. The next day we drove to another beautiful village to meet dissident journalist Flavio Paschino, founder of blckbx.tv, Black Box, blackbox.tv. Paschino is a sophisticated producer and media personality whose whole career reporting on sporting events stopped cold in lockdowns. Outdoor biking events were not permitted. Along the way, I reveled in the flat green fields edged always with shimmering canals, and I enjoyed seeing white swans walking across the fields and settling down on the grass. grass. Tulip season was beginning. Here you can see the feature Pasquino produced, in which I warn, if Europe does not wake up, you will all be dead. Perhaps that message of warning was strongly worded, but in that interview I became really alarmed, as then... And in subsequent interviews, I learned that the truth, or rather the details, 
about the dangers of the mRNA injections has been largely suppressed in Europe. People know in general that something is wrong, but the details I offered from the War Room Daily Clout reports seemed shockingly new to Dutch audiences. I watched as Peschino and later other Dutch influencers and audiences were being forced to grapple with the questions, how could this be? How could they do this to us? I realized that America, or many Americans and Europe, or many Europeans, are at different points in Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's famous five stages of grief. The Dutch with whom I shared the information in the Pfizer documents were struggling with denial and moving into depression, while I and many others who had heard the reports on War Room and elsewhere had already crossed that Rubicon and lived sadly in the final stage of acceptance. I spent that interview and later events too explaining they really did try to kill us and to sterilize us. And here is why. The next days were a marathon. I spoke to a live audience of about 130, almost all Dutch, in the lovely event venue Antropia. Though I had spent decades visiting European countries and addressing live audiences, I now had not spoken to a live audience in Europe since I had been cancelled by the White House via Twitter in 2021. The second day of my tour, we had sustained a multi-pronged attack that was quite scary to experience. Not only had Brian been detained and questioned at length upon our arrival, but after my first interview in Europe about the Pfizer documents, suddenly dailyclout.io was blocked so that few could see or download, download the War Room Daily Clout reports for themselves. And simultaneously, two of our major vendors told us that they were restricting our business activities. The same day, LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube all suppressed our content. It was daunting to carry on in the face of that cyber harassment. Yet, as I gladly received a standing ovation from the audience at Antropia, accepting it gratefully on behalf of Amy Kelly and the research volunteers rather than for myself personally, I was baffled that even with all the forces from the White House to Google and on down that were trying to keep us from speaking and listening about life-saving truths, mysteriously, here we were, and the truth had survived it all. I felt that there was something inexplicable about all of this that I could only identify as the activity of grace. When I signed books afterward, I heard even more about what the Dutch are facing. A farmer, looking shell-shocked, explained that the geoengineering is now so bad and his fields are now so wet that no seeds would grow. The farmers in his area had to artificially dry out their fields. Another reader explained to me that the Dutch see what is happening around them in terms of the loss of their liberties, but they are afraid. What are they afraid of? I asked persistently, as I did not quite understand the situation. There had been pressure to get vaccinated, I had been told, for instance, but there had not been, outside of certain professions, mandates. Finally, some attendees there explained to me that many people were afraid of losing their benefits. I thought of how... Brilliantly, the EU had lulled Europe into this seductive, dangerous situation, so much upon which people relied, derived now from the state, that it has created a situation in which many people can be easily cowed, if not outright enslaved. Our last day, the MyDrews team took me to Polder country to meet the highly accomplished journalist Carol von Wolferen. Van Wolferen had written many books. A massive bestseller was The Enigma of Japanese Power. I was smitten with the Polder region. We found ourselves driving through vast meadows reclaimed from the sea waters. The dikes and channels of water that sluiced the landscape had not changed their shape, my host explained, for 500 years. I was charmed by the small red brick farmhouses, the pollarded pear trees, the white wooden drawbridges every few hundred feet or so, the daffodils planted in even distances along the waterways, the walking paths everywhere along the canals. There is great enchantment in how the Dutch, in this area especially, made every outdoor corner into a kind of open-air room. 
Here is a wooden rain barrel catching water. There is a white wire garden bench. There are purple pansies with black faces spilling from a basket suspended in the shadow of thatched eaves. One had the sense that every inch of this small country had been inhabited deeply for centuries, and that every inch had been and was still deeply known and loved. When I entered Ben Wolfren's studio slash library, it was a converted cow shed, and you could still see where the cow's flanks had rubbed the paint off of the central pillars. I felt that sixty years or more of European civilization was gathered in one place. The studio slash library was wall to wall with the great books of the post-war era, including a bound set of the official history of World War II, as well as a set of the very rare and influential avant-garde publication Encounter magazine. Van Wolferen had not acquired these as a collector, but organically as a reader. It was intoxicating to see such a library. And I felt a pang for the bright light of European culture and of this accumulated knowledge and critical tradition that that library represented. The books seamlessly were in conversation with each other decade by decade, and all of that, I mourned, was being metaphorically torched in the world outside those doors. Van Wolferen and I had a robust two-hour discussion, including a debate about the state of civil liberties. We disagreed about China and a few other points, but the exchange was illuminating. I was honored to see that his magazine had several times featured the War Room Daily Clout Volunteers' work on the Pfizer papers. Indeed, I appeared in one number in a cartoon. I was relieved that the work was being reported. We labor away in the United States, siloed by the algorithms that divide us, and we do not know if the freedom movement in Europe knows anything about our work. By the same token, the great work of the freedom movement in Europe is also concealed from us by similar algorithms. Karel von Wolferen, Wolferen left, my publisher Fred Myrus right, the white structure behind us is a drawbridge, pictured here. Van Wolfer and the Myrus team and I ended the day in a restaurant overlooking a canal. The building had been an inn for 300 years. I had to try Dutch gin. Upon experiencing the taste of bitterballen, a sublime Dutch delicacy containing minced beef and cream sauce, the luscious lamb dish, the sweet roasted parsnips, and upon admiring the whipped cream served with the trifle for dessert, I felt that there was hope after all. All around me, the Dutch were enjoying their beautiful traditional cuisine, admiring their magnificent landscape, speaking their venerable language with its soft fricatives that was both addictive and restful to listen to. People laughed and talked deeply, more deeply than my own people did these days, over the candlelight. I reflected that whatever had been in the injections imposed on that population Perhaps the effects were milder than was the damage done to us in the U.S., as the Dutch on the whole seemed less ill, less pale, and less zombie-like than did many of us in America. But all of those observations were impressionistic. When it was time for Brian and me to leave the country, we were sorry. We'd miss our new friends. The Myrus team, after kindly waking at dawn to get us to the airport, drove us through the green fields in a gray rain. I'd been to Holland, as noted above, several times. Each time, before I'd been cancelled for wrong think, the major news sites had covered my work and reported on my visit. This time around, however, except for the alternative media, there was absolute silence from the mainstream press. I'd assumed that my message was unwelcome and unpopular in general, or that it had gone mostly unheard. But again, somehow, the truth lives its way into a community in need of the information, even after every massive effort has been made to stifle and suppress it. Again, I do not understand how. On our final day, I had been standing outside of a cafe on the Herringracht, waiting for my publisher's car to locate me. Naomi? asked a woman in her thirties whom I did not know. She wore a nice camel-colored raincoat 
and had tussled brown hair and looked like someone who walked a great deal in the wind and sun. She was one of a pleasant-looking couple. She paused on the sidewalk and peered curiously into my face. Yes, I replied cautiously. Good job, she said. How awesome would it be to have a stranger walk up to you and then just say, good job. I, I, I aspire to that one day. Thank you, everybody, for watching right now. Do me a favor. Hit that thumbs up button. And I also want to thank all of you watching on X. There's 122 of you watching on X right now. That is super cool. Uh, let's see here. I I just want to say about Naomi Wolf, I, uh, I came, her work came to my attention really early in 2021 like crazy early in 2021. She just did a video saying, okay, so <laughs> we can't have a free society when you're mandating that people get certain shots, especially when they're horrifying, untested crap. And ever since then, whatever our ideological differences might be, and I'm sure they're significant, although I don't really follow her politics all that much, uh, we're on the same team, I think. You know, you can never be for sure. But... Uh, I'm very, very grateful for her work and for her amazing ability in writing. Don't forget to go to epicminerals.com. For those of you coming late, just watch this video. He said something that really hit home about uh, this phenomena of chemtrails. Manganese will make you kill your mama. How much manganese are you spraying in my neighborhood at night while I'm asleep? Military and some commercial jets have been fitted with huge barrels of at least 49 different kinds of documented chemical poisons. Barium is toxic to all mammals. Aluminum is known to diminish kidney function and destroy brain cells and cognitive function. A problem, a serious problem. Patent number 5003186 describes cooling the earth with metal oxides sprayed into the stratosphere. And I thought, well, geez, this is what I do for a living. I was finding tons and tons of large quantities of aluminum, barium, strontium in the forms of oxides and sulfates. Instead of protecting the people, we are poisoning the people. Detox and prevent metal poisoning at epicminerals.net. That's epicminerals. Dot net. Use promo code Shapiro to pry a dollar from my grasping hands. All right, we got ourselves a new, a new one to do, and this time it'll be from Katie Kirkland. Oops. From makeartgoodagain.substack.com, Truth in Fiction by Katie Kirkland. The awakening is a funny thing. For most, it starts with noticing just one or two things that are off in the world and not being satisfied with the surface level explanations given. Then you notice another thing, then another, and another. Then you realize that so many of these seemingly disparate things are actually connected. Before you know it, the way you look at the world has been turned on its head and you see everything with new eyes. No matter which particular issue begins an individual's awakening, at some point, usually sooner rather than later, we each notice the pervasiveness of propaganda in every sector of society. Sometimes it is even the propaganda itself that begins the awakening process, when something that was previously socially acceptable suddenly, seemingly overnight, becomes off-limits, or when someone asks what he or she thought to be a benign, reasonable question only to be viciously attacked for it. These are the moments when the propaganda backfires, and instead of triggering shame and silence, as it was meant to, it triggers curiosity and a desire to take a closer look. Regardless of whether noticing the propaganda was the starting point of an awakening journey or the byproduct of it, the propaganda itself is one of those things we start to look at with new eyes. At first, we look at it with anger. 
as we start to notice it everywhere, we get mad, mad at ourselves for not seeing it before, mad at those around us for not seeing it now, mad at those who disseminate it in order to manipulate the masses. But for many of us, as time goes on, that anger changes. After all, constant rage is unsustainable, and when the rage ebbs, we can adjust our view of the propaganda once again. Often this new view is more analytical in nature. We want to understand not only how the propaganda itself works, but also the thought process and purpose behind it. We study it and ask questions about it in an attempt to better know our enemy's mind. This analysis isn't even something we necessarily do in any formal way. Most are not going out of their way to gather up samples of propaganda to study. Instead, they learn to spot it in their everyday lives. And rather than just blindly consuming it or rolling their eyes and ignoring it, as they may have done before, they take a mental note. This is what it means to wake up. It's not which specific things you figured out are lies or becoming a deep dive researcher. To be awake is to be people who go through life with active questioning minds, attempting to understand the world for ourselves rather than passively letting some so-called authority figure dictate our understanding to us. One place where we encounter propaganda in our daily lives is in the Hollywood productions we consume for entertainment. Most of us have long ago realized that Hollywood's main purpose is not to entertain us, though there is a bread and circuses element to it, but to propagandize us. Once we've figured that out, we view film and television differently, more critically. We look for the propaganda and try to figure out what its purpose might be. But as we watch movies and TV shows with an eye to spot the manipulations and subversions, we sometimes come up against a conundrum. Because sometimes a piece of entertainment actually manages to project a fair amount of truth. Of course, there are different types of truth. There are allegorical truths, stories that have little or no basis in reality as we know it, but somehow in their often fantastical settings reflect truth and reality more clearly than many stories set entirely in the so-called real world. The Matrix would be a good example of a film with allegorical truths. Then there are Historical films and shows that purport to tell the true stories of real people or events from either the distant or recent past. Oftentimes, these films are used, sometimes subtly and sometimes not so subtly, to rewrite history or to use historical events to manipulate people's perceptions of current events. But occasionally, a movie or a show comes along that truly does attempt to portray the events of history with a level of fidelity. Then, there are the films and TV shows that portray fictionalized versions of part of the real world. Movies like Zoolander, Josie and the Pussycats, or Tropic Thunder. TV shows like Veep, Parks and Recreation, or Better Off Ted. These shows take place in niche areas of society, whether that be various parts of the entertainment industry, the world of politics and government, the corporate world, etc., and often reveal truths about that area of society. Truths that in real life we're not supposed to notice, or at the very least, not supposed to worry about. Whatever form the truth takes, when it is revealed in a Hollywood film or show, there is a question we find ourselves asking. How did the creators get away with that? The answers that we come up with vary. Some think this is part of the satanic practices of the elites. They must disclose what they do, no matter if this discourse occurs under the veil of fiction in order to get our consent. Others believe that by putting what they are actually doing into story form, then they are able to get people to write off the so-called conspiracy theorists. It's ridiculous to think the entertainment industry and governments are in cahoots to brainwash people MK Ultra style. Those are the plots of Josie and the Pussycats and Zoolander. Still, others with a more optimistic perspective think these films and shows could be the works of genuinely earnest people in Hollywood who have figured out how to work the system covertly to get good stories filled with truths made. 
all of these theories are plausible. Personally, I think the truth could be that a bit of each of them is true. I think sometimes we get so caught up in trying to figure out the motivations of the so-called elites that we forget that the people are not cartoon villains. They can have multiple motivations and goals for doing things. But since we're discussing theories as to why Hollywood sometimes puts the truth in plain sight, I have a couple of my own to add to the fray. For my first theory, I want to focus specifically on that third type of truth, which I mentioned above, the shows and movies that portray fictional versions of real life, and not just any areas of reality, but the areas that hold many of the levers of power in society. Whether that be cultural levers, as with Zoolander, Josie and the Pussycats, and Tropic Thunder, which inhabit the worlds of fashion, music, and the film industry, respectively, or political and governmental levers, as with Veep and Parks and Rec, or the levers held by giant corporations, such as Better Off Ted. You may have noted that the films and shows I just listed are all satires and comedies, of course, there are plenty of other examples that fall into this category that are not comedies. House of Cards could be an example. However, I think the comedies and satires illustrate a truism. It is easier to laugh at yourself when you are winning. You see, when these movies and shows were made, Hollywood firmly had the culture in hand. It was deftly herding society in exactly the direction it wanted us to go. It could afford to laugh at itself and maybe also laugh at us a little bit for being so easy to manipulate. And because Hollywood was winning and they knew it, it didn't sting so much when we laughed at them. As the saying goes, we weren't laughing at Hollywood, we were laughing with them. They thought there was no risk in making movies that mocked themselves while also pulling back the curtain to show us what was really going on in the world. But things have shifted. Today, we, the people whose values and culture Hollywood has spent decades trying to stamp out, are now the ones who are winning. One way to tell we are winning is because now we are the ones who are okay with poking fun at ourselves. Of course, there are those in our movement who still take themselves far too seriously ever to laugh themselves or their cause, but on the whole, there is a levity within the circles we now call MAGA that didn't exist a decade ago. We can laugh at ourselves. We can even laugh along when the so-called elites make a rare yet genuinely funny joke at our expense, even when we don't laugh at those jokes. They no longer sting the way they once did. On the other hand, Hollywood and the other entertainment industries are not laughing at themselves so much anymore. To the contrary, they seem to be taking themselves more and more seriously by the day. It is now rare to see Hollywood poking fun at itself or at the other industries that have held the reins of power for who knows how long. This is because... They are not winning anymore. In fact, they're losing. They're losing the culture war. They're losing the info war. And they're losing the political war. When you're losing and your very way of life is on the line, suddenly it's not so much fun to laugh at yourself or be laughed at by those who are beating you. Of course, Outside of the niche of films and shows that mock powerful industries, this theory may not hold much water, so I have a second theory on why truth is imbued into entertainment. It goes back to the idea of Hollywood's main purpose being to propagandize us and subvert the culture. Often in this community, we find ourselves believing, either consciously or unconsciously, that because they lie about everything, then everything must be a lie. But that is not the case. You see, it is easier to get people to swallow lies when those lies are surrounded by truth. This could be because the undiscerning person fails to spot the unsavory elements hidden amongst the truth, or it could be because the more discerning person does recognize those unsavory elements and chooses to put up with them rather than throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Either way, the presence of truth often keeps us comfortable enough that we stick around and listen to the lies. 
And if we're not careful, the longer we do that, the more desensitized to the subversions we become. The best case scenario is that desensitization leads us to a place of apathy. Worst case scenario, we start believing those lies, accepting the subversions. I believe that in order for a story to be considered enjoyable to large numbers of people, it must contain truth. It cannot be all lies, all subversion. There may be some in society, certain especially degenerate groups and subcultures that are drawn to pure lies and subversion, but those are the minority and not really the sorts of people that Hollywood aims to capture. Hollywood aims to appeal to the majority because that is the most efficient way to shift the culture. Discerning and undiscerning viewers alike we are all more accepting of lies and subversions when they are wrapped in a comfortable blanket of truth. This community loves the Matrix. I even wrote a piece on it a while back because of all the allegorical truths it presents. Yet the heroes of that story treat the majority of humanity, victims from birth, trapped within the Matrix as disposable NPCs. They go around killing anyone and everyone who gets in their way without a second thought. This is excused with a line about how the agents of the Matrix can take over virtually any body of a person trapped in the Matrix, yet no attempts are ever made to avoid or minimize collateral damage. Kill the NPCs because they could become a threat. Lots of truth laced with an incredible devaluing of human life. Josie and the Pussycats tells us how the music industry is used to brainwash teenagers. It reveals the consumerist agenda. It shows the partnership between the government and private companies to manipulate and control the American people. It shows how the global governments all know about this and want in on it. It shows how when one of their schemes is revealed, they pick a few of their own to be fall guys to appease those who demand justice. So much truth. And yet, the film is... Laden with sexual innuendo, our three heroines all dress provocatively with the most innocent, naive, and sweet of the three dressing the most provocatively. For all the truths it tells, it also seeks to subvert the culture by pushing a hypersexualized agenda on its viewers. The morning after the 2016 election, I woke up and grabbed my phone to see who won and was elated to see that it was Trump. After celebrating and getting past that initial wave of joy and relief, my next thought was, film and television are going to suck. I wasn't even truly awake at this point in time, but I was awake enough to know that Hollywood was going to punish us for voting for Trump. Hollywood's job is to educate, read, brainwash us, and it failed. I knew this meant that we were in for years of lectures from almost every TV show and movie that would be made while Trump was in office. <laughs> sure enough, just under a year later, TV shows started to go downhill, substituting stories laced with propaganda for propaganda laced with stories. Movies took a bit more time to start being truly terrible. After all, they are bigger and more time-consuming projects, so it takes longer to get the ball rolling, but they followed suit as soon as they were able. Of course, it has always been Hollywood's intent to ramp up agendas to the point we are at today. They've been building up to this for decades. I noticed in the early 2010s that PG-13 comedies had all but disappeared. While there have always been PG-13 films that were inappropriately labeled such and were far from appropriate for the teen audience they targeted, many were the sorts of movies that families with older children could enjoy together or even that parents would be comfortable letting their teens go see in theaters unsupervised. However, slowly but surely, those sorts of movies seemed to have died out, being replaced with raunchy R-rated comedies in the vein of The Hangover and Bridesmaids. Even network TV shows, which are ostensibly constrained by the FCC, have become increasingly raunchy and promiscuous. Brokeback Mountain came out in 2005, 
as a way to test the cultural waters regarding homosexuality. After the backlash, Hollywood pulled back for a time, but never to the point we were at prior to Brokeback Mountain. From then on, there was an increased presence of LGBT characters in film and television. The sassy gay friend in every ABC or CW show, the conniving but oppressed gay man in Downton Abbey and every other historical film or show, the female character in virtually every television series who experimented with women in college, the transgender housekeeper in elementary, the characters who were not originally LGBT but who were later changed, either via notice from their creators outside of the films themselves or in reboots of the films. Dumbledore in the Harry Potter franchise and Le Feu in the 2017 live-action remake of Disney's Beauty and the Beast serve as a couple of examples of this LGBT retroactive community. For as long as I can remember, almost any time politics comes up in a TV show or a movie, a negative comment must be made about Republicans. Keep in mind that even though the GOP is part of the Uniparty, when Hollywood takes a dig at Republicans, it is meant to be a dig at anyone with anything approaching conservative values. If characters from a sophisticated part of the country visit the South or the countryside, the locals are portrayed as incompetent or bigoted or uneducated or cult members or all of the above. Christians have consistently either been ignored, with atheism being more or less the default, watered down or demonized. When a character, at least a character that we're supposed to like, does have faith, it is rarely any form of Christianity, instead typically leaning towards Eastern-influenced spirituality or something akin to universalism. Characters who are Christian are typically shown in a bad light, and on the rare occasion that a Christian character is portrayed positively, that character rarely lives out his or her faith in any meaningful way. If there wasn't that occasional episode here or there where he or she casually mentioned being a Christian, then you would never know he or she had a faith based on the lifestyles and values exhibited in every other episode. Hollywood's push to change the culture is not a new thing. It didn't start when Trump came into office. It didn't start in just the last decade or two. It's been happening probably since Hollywood's inception. Little by little, they have added more violence, more gore, more promiscuity, more LGBT characters, more snipes at the quote-unquote uneducated, more comments demonizing conservatives, more subversion of Christianity, more glorification of atheism and spirituality, more gender division, more racial division, etc., etc., etc. Yes, the subversion of our culture and values has been happening little by little for years, and with each year they push just a little bit further. We would have eventually got to the point we're at now, but I believe it would have taken a bit longer, and many viewers would not have even noticed it had happened. But when Trump won in 2016, they went from inching forward, little by little, slowly boiling the frog, and instead put the pedal to the floor. Trump's win showed Hollywood that it didn't have quite the grasp on the American mind that it thought it had. So, they panicked. They tossed out good storytelling that appealed to core truths and brought in heavy-handed preaching, unveiled propaganda. The bulk of Hollywood productions are now so bad that even people who are sympathetic towards the agendas Hollywood pushes recognize that there is something wrong. Something has changed. They may not be willing to recognize that the core reason film and television have gone downhill revolves around the increase of the very propaganda with which they agree, instead pointing at other issues, which often are good points but don't get to the root. But they at least are willing to acknowledge that what comes out of Hollywood today is, at best, mediocre. Hollywood making this error of putting story and truth on the back burner is good news for us in the culture war. As I mentioned near the beginning of this article, the propaganda is backfiring. In many cases, it is waking people up as they realize there is an active, coordinated agenda at play. In other cases, it's simply so lacking in entertainment value that many people are consuming it less. And if they're consuming it less, they're not being influenced by it as much. For whatever reason or combination of reasons, Hollywood used to excel at balancing the truth with propaganda, but 
they have lost that skill. And in doing so, they have lost their advantage in the culture war. Now, it is up to us to take advantage of their misstep. That is makeartgoodagain.substack.com. Makeartgoodagain.substack.com. Go there. Do a subscription. Do a paid subscription if you have the means by which to do these things. Remember, you got to support what you like or it goes away. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. What an exciting thing to have this many people watching on, on, uh, on Twitter. Seriously, 157 on Twitter is a lot for me. Uh, so Twitter has really done a really good job sort of starting to de-shadow ban people. Very exciting stuff. So thank you, everybody, for watching. Don't forget, go to epicminerals.net. That's epicminerals.net. Use promo code Shapiro to pry a dollar from my grasping hands. You can also go to epicthreads.tv. That's right, epicthreads.tv to get the most amazing artisan soap that you've ever used in your entire life. This is lemongrass and poppy seed that we have right here, but I can show you an assortment of the other ones that we have, and you're going to love them. Let me tell you that right now. But you can also get all of the epic... Uh, the Epic Minerals products at epicthreads.tv. So let me show you the, the assortment of Epic Threads soaps. Bam. Wait, just that's the sweet orange. Where are all the soaps? Just click on artisan soap up here. Our hand-picked artisan soap offers a luxurious natural alternative to commercial soaps made with organic ingredients for a gentle and nourishing cleanse. Experience the unique scents and rich lather provided by our skilled artisans while supporting a small business and prioritizing your health and well-being. Charity and Laura are, are soap makers, soapstresses. I don't know what the term is, uh, but they crank these bad boys out. They're of varying sizes, and the size of the soap bar uh, is directly proportional to the prices. So you're getting bigger soap, generally speaking, uh, for the more expensive. But we've got these amazing soaps, all named by our staff here at epicthreads.tv headquarters. That would be my wife and sister-in-law. And these soaps are called Sweet Orange Soap, Rosy Quartz, Arabian Woods, Sharp Dressed Man is a name for a soap, Pink Grapefruit, Lemongrass, oh no, this Lemongrass and Poppy Seed, Love Soap, Love at First Sight, Galaxy Quest, it's got space, it's, it's space soap, and then Wild Time and Heather, not Wild Time with Heather, Wild Time and Heather, Wild Time with Heather, was um, vetoed as the name. So there's that. Go to epicthreads.tv for all of these collections. Thank you so much for watching. Let us pray. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. I love you all. Thank you so much for being here. And I'll see you tomorrow. Oh, hang on. Where is my Trump pen? It's here somewhere. Hold for processing. It's it's here. I got this nice backpack that keeps my entire mobile studio in here. And uh, man, it sure does turn into a bird's nest, though. Oh, well, anyway. Oh, I know where it is. It's got to be in here. There we go. All right. Thanks, everybody, for watching, and I'll see you next time. I will be the greatest president that God ever created.